Well, welcome to our, our second of the series of uh, ancient history seminars for the divorce, the autumn term. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Louise Revels from uh, Southampton University. Uh, Louise has worked on epigraphic cultures and Roman imperialism. Uh, specifically in, in the Western Roman provinces, uh, Spain and Roman Britain. Uh, it, it, its main focus is primary yeah. focus, previously, oh, yeah. uh, and is currently again turning to to, uh, to Spain and to work on uh, urban history. Um, she's well, we met actually at a, a <coughs> conference that Greg Wolf ran on um, uh, periodism and gender. Or, Gender and Empire, or some something like that, uh, where we all sat around and struggled to <laughs> work, work out how gender and empire's various ways of thinking uh, in, interacted. And so when we were running this, uh, we stepped putting together this this, this seminar series. Uh, Louise was one of the first people um, I thought of because of her way in which she crosses a few disciplinary boundaries. And as last week. We had uh, Beth Every Holden talking in, there in a more biographical way, um, and we ended that talk by thinking about how models of gender uh, and, uh, might move from uh, the centre of Rome through the structures of imperialism uh, to, to the provinces. This was a rather a neat segue into um, what Louise is going to be talking to us about today, which is uh, Women and Cultural Change in the Roman West, uh, a promising new light on an old topic. Talking of lights, have you got pictures? Should I, yes, I, should, I, should should pictures. I dim, so dim, dim, dim the light a tiny bit? Yeah, I think we're dimming a little. Uh, which sometimes works. <laughs> Um, people who talk about women um, in the Roman provinces are, or at least opportunities to talk about women in the Roman provinces, are distressingly rare. Um, it has to be said that the um, work on the western provinces in particular lags way behind other branches of ancient history in terms of acknowledging that the um, past was not filled full of male um, adult men. Um, and that there are actually women in the um, Roman provinces, particularly the Western Roman provinces. Um, what I'm going to do today, as much as anything, is an experiment, well not an experiment, but a discussion of the possible, a discussion of how we can take some of our existing um, knowledge about the Western provinces in particular, and actually think about how imperialism might have impacted on gender. In the very final part of the talk, I'll talk a bit about families, and that will be um, research I've done. But up until then, for about the first three quarters of the talk, what I'm going to be doing is very unshamedly taking other people's work, which has been done under the light of imperialism and the impact of empire on the Western provinces, and actually take their results, take their conclusions, and say, well, actually, what happens if we start to think of it with a slightly different mindset? A mindset where not only is it what is the impact on, say, the settlement structures, the economy, all that kind of thing, but what actually is the impact on the people? And through thinking about the impact on the people, how might that might actually give us a way into thinking about gender, whether we can answer the questions about gender and women in the Roman provinces, and the Western provinces, is a different matter, but at least it gives us a way of approaching um, these questions. So what I'm gonna do is address two aspects of ways in which we might put um, gender into the ways in which we think about Roman imperialism. As I said, the first element is how we actually incorporate questions of gender into our existing knowledge of these processes. 
um, and the way in which these processes may have disrupted existing gender relations within the provinces. <coughs> but the second aspect is then to take a step back from our assumptions that they're just doing what the Romans did, so that therefore we can take our law codes or our knowledge of what's going on in Rome and Italy and apply it unthinkingly to the provinces. Certainly in the case of the Western provinces, if you read a book that's entitled Women in Roman X, whether it's Roman Britain or Roman Spain, they will at some point go through all the various stuff about Roman family and um, Roman marriage and all those kinds of things, and basically trot through the evidence from Rome and Italy. Um, and so in the very final part of this, I'm going to ask whether we can actually do this, whether this is a valid approach. But to start with, the first element I want to deal with is the problem, is the question of how we understand the impact of Roman um, gender on the provinces. And this is the bit I've probably unfairly called Add Women and Stir, which, if you know your various waves of feminism um, and feminist history, approaches to history, is putting us very firmly in first and second wave. Um, arguably, if you're dealing with the Western provinces, that is a step forward, um, unfortunately. Um, but from the outset, we need to think about what happens when we actually do think, um, when we do question what the impact of imperialism is on um, women. From the outset, we have to acknowledge that it's not a simple matter, as the impacts might have a number of forms. The least disruptive may be that actually gender relations carry on undisrupted from the pre-conquest period that they might start adopting new forms of jewellery um, or new forms of um, burial goods, for example, associated with the presentation of the body. And so the decoration of the body is responding to new materials available, but that actually the underlying questions of what is a man, what is a woman, what are potentially other genders within that society, um, remain unchanged. And so the equipment used to express the difference between genders changes, but actually the underlying um, gender ideologies, gender structures do not. At the other side, of, at the other um, extreme, we might have substantial shifts. Um, the eradication of pre-existing gender identities, new ones coming in, um, reshaping of gender difference within these societies, and so really quite a substantial disruption. Answering the questions about these kinds of questions about what the impact of imperialism is on gender in the Western provinces has been pretty much hampered by a lack of research into gender in um, the West in Roman provincial archaeology, in contrast to the kind of work that's being done on ancient history. And as somebody who was initially trained as an ancient historian and then moved sideways into Roman provincial archaeology, I was absolutely taken aback by the fact that there didn't seem to be any women or any discussion of women in this school of thought when I'd been trained in and come through at the time when everything seemed to be you had to have an underground module on women in the ancient world, gender in the ancient world, sexuality in the ancient world. These questions were just not being asked. So that's one complication is that this is still something which there is not a, a sort of substantial body of literature on. But the second complication is that if we want to understand the potential disruption, we actually need to understand what's going on before Rome conquers these areas, and Rome interacts with these areas. And however um, negative and sarcastic I might be about Roman provincial um, archaeologists and historians, the same is true for people who study the Iron Age, actually. And so certainly dealing with Spain, Britain, and France, there again is very little work. And so we suffer from the problem of trying to understand um, how, what the pre-existing gender relations, gender differentiation was like, and therefore what the impact of Rome might be. And so you end up with a tendency that to ascribe anything that's different to Rome is therefore continuity, whereas in fact what we're lacking is the picture of the much longer range or longer um, sort of patterns of gender relations um, into which Rome then implants itself. Now, so far I've picked a negative, painted a pretty negative picture of why we can't do this. But actually, um, in a way we can, if we change our mindset, and this is where, as I said, start playing some, games is the wrong word, but start posing some hypothetical questions. 
If we are to take the idea that gender and gender difference is something which is performative, which is something that's enacted and internalized through everyday activities, through the way in which we live our, live our everyday um, lives, the routinized and repetitive activities of a daily basis, whether you call it social practice, practice, praxis, habitus, whichever. If we think that that's how identities are formed, then actually we have the tools at our disposal to understand the, disrupt, the potential disruption in the everyday practices through which gender is formed. Because these form the basis of much of the work that has already been done on the Western provinces. And so if we start sort of reframing the questions that we're asking in this material, we can start to say something about the potential disruption. And what I'm going to do next is focus on three specific aspects. These are three aspects which have been intensively researched um, for the Roman provinces and as branches of Roman imperialism. The first of these is urbanism, the second is economic activity, and the third of these is the military. Um, what I hope to demonstrate is that if we start saying, okay, if we put questions of gender into these established pictures, what kinds of things do we start seeing? Um, I will be focusing very much on the Western provinces, um, but I'm not saying this is something that is unique to the Western provinces, and actually it's an approach which could be taken to anywhere in the Roman Empire um, as a way of thinking about impact of imperialism. So, let's add women and stir. So if we start with urbanism, urbanization is probably one of the most marked features of Roman imperialism in the Western provinces, um, where we go from what is largely a non-urban settlement system to, if you're in Spain, a very heavily, or in the Iberian Peninsula, a very heavily urbanized um, settlement structure. But even in um, Gaul, Britain, we see the um, development of urbanism as the focus of the settlement structures. But here, what I don't want to think about is the actual physicality of the town maps and everything, the buildings that you get in this process of development, but actually the idea of citizenship, the practice of being urban. Now I don't mean Roman citizenship. What I actually mean is that when these towns are given their charters, the body of people who previously lived in the area are then turned into citizens of the local town. With many of the same kinds of duties and responsibilities that actually a Roman citizen had in Republican Rome. Ironically, of course, but in Rome by this point, they don't. But in the provinces, this is the model, or at least certainly in the Western provinces, this is the model. And in Spain, we are very lucky because we have a series of charters, a series of urban laws which are given to these communities. One which is given to the municipia, um, and one which is given to a colonia. Um, both dating to the first century AD. And the municipal law is particularly important because it dates to the period when almost every settlement that could even vaguely be described as a town is given an urban charter um, during the Flavian period. Now, we tend, when we look at this, to think of these in a legal context. We tend to think of them in terms of magistrates if we're putting anyone in. There's a whole series of um, elements within this that are about the responsibilities of the magistrates and that kind of thing. But if we look at them closely, we also get to find out what a citizen does. Because just to take this example of um, chapter 55 from the municipal law, uh, usually known as the Lex Ernitana, but this is actually the fragment from Malaga. Um, what we have is the process of voting in the annual magistrates. That all the citizens, all the municipalities of the society of, of that particular town are to come by curia to cast their votes in such a way that the presiding magistrate summon all the curia to the vote with one summons and each of them cast its votes by ballot in, a separate, enclo in separate enclosures. Um, and it kind of goes on as to this full day's activity of voting, then hanging around waiting for the count, and then actually in the forum, watching the magistrates swear their oath of office um, for the year in the name of various deified emperors. <laughs> what we actually see is that politics, or at least elections, are envisaged as a highly public event, a communal event carried out in the local forum in the company of the whole citizen body. 
But of course women are not eligible to vote in these. Our citizens are adult male only. Um, a young boy can think that will be me in 10 years time, but no woman can. And so immediately by this, we have a new form of gender differentiation. Differentiation by who is politically active, who is not. And this is not just about being a magistrate and being an elite magistrate. This is about taking part in the, in the annual elections and various other things. But this isn't a binary opposition between civic male and excluded female. And here there's been a huge amount of work done by Emily Hemelrick on um, women within the Roman provinces and how they're recorded in inscriptions as being taking on active roles. And she's demonstrated how elite women acted as benefactors and occasionally as patronesses to their communities, paying for public works from banquets to substantial building projects and potentially acting as mediators between the town and the wider networks of um, imperialism and authority and power. And so she argues that actually through these political means of benefaction, patronage, or being adopted as a patron, um, acting in this way, women actually can have um, an element of integration into public life and a way of acquiring political dignitas, political authority, in a, in a very well, somewhat reduced way. But this would not have been available to all women, obviously. And so what we're starting to do is to take the experience of women in the Roman provinces and think about how we've now got intersections with rank, with social rank and social wealth. Women who took part in civic benefaction and patronage would have been amongst the wealthiest in society, many from leading families, leading established families, or from the new, new rich aiming to promote their family name. So politics and political activity not only forms a new way of gender differentiation, but immediately introduces us to the idea that this is quite complex and we're not talking about a single picture of women in the Roman provinces. A second mode of urban participation is through religious activity. And again, we can take this beyond the elite. For the elite, someone like Vibia Modesto, and this is an inscription from Italica, just outside Seville in southern Spain, dating to the third century AD, um, Italica is, um, and this inscription was actually found in a building that we think is um, to the, dedicated to the deified Trajan, and certainly from form and various other things, seems to be Hadrianic, it's almost certainly Hadrianic in date, and probably sponsored by Hadrian, because Italica is his birthplace. Um, she was a Flaminica, she comes from a, a wealthy family, she was a priestess of the imperial cult, and she um, gave a whole series of um, Offerings to the temple, huge numbers of um, huge amount of statuary, statuary adorned with massive amounts of bling. Here's the only way to describe it: gold crowns, this, that, and the other. She also gives her golden flaminica's crown um, as part of that. But again, but there is a danger of elite exceptionalism, and so we might point to not only someone like Vivian Modesta taking part in religious activity. But to two rather anonymous, well not anonymous, we at least know their names, but two rather unremarkable women from Britain, Arminia and Lavanisa, who gave offerings of, well, not really offerings, who uh, deposited cursed tablets in the sacred spring in Bath in Britain. And um, this was the focus for, the sacred spring itself becomes a focus for dedications. Um, it's enclosed and there's probably an, uh, an element of almost like mystery surrounding it. When they excavated it, um, they unearthed about 120 odd of these, and so cursing is a really prominent part of ritual activity at Bath. But we also have evidence of women. Now these are probably quite low class women, um, cursing the people, whether male or women, who undertook curses, by and large don't have tria nomina, and by and large have Celtic names. So this is highly likely to be the local, not particularly <coughs> the population. And here we have two women cursing whoever, um, but they should undergo severe um, punishments um, enacted by the goddess for the theft, presumably, of two silver coins on the one hand and a cape on the other. So suggesting that these are not actually particularly elite women. And we can sort of add to these all the anonymous women who deposit bracelets 
and jewellery and earrings and everyday items within the various um, religious contexts, not just places like Bath, but any number of temple sites where we find these type things. And so we have women adjusting to new ways of interacting with the gods. Are there differences in who deposits what? We don't know, it's hard to answer these questions. But certainly we've got an active participation going on. Um, another element of this is that we know, again from the urban charters in Spain, that part of what you do when you found a town, or turn a town, an existing settlement, into a Roman-style town, is that you put together a religious calendar. A religious calendar which involves games, which involves, um, which might involve processions, which might involve sacrifices and um, festivals, and banquets. And there are a number of um, dedications such as this. Again, we have a priestess, we have another member of the elite doing stuff, but we're not as so much interested in her. More interested in the final um, clause of this, a banquet having been shared out between both sexes. And this is one of a number of inscriptions um, from Southern Spain, which actually stipulate that the banquet was donated to feed both sexes within the society, that all these people, both men and women, are participating in this. So with a little bit of hypothetical reconstruction and a little bit of alternative reading of established evidence, we can start to understand what the potential impact might be um, of um, urbanization, um, both politics and religion within an urban context, on the lives um, of women. We can see a political system might create new modes of gender differentiation based on concepts of citizenship, but also how the intersection of gender and status or wealth negates creating a very simplistic picture of this. And we can do a similar thing if we turn to economic activity, although here um, we're on slightly um, less verifiable ground, it should be said. But why, one of the things which has been extensively studied is the way in which um, Roman imperialism brought wider economic changes, and in particular, intensification in production and specialization of economy of economic roles. Sorry, yeah, specialization in terms of industrial roles in certain industries. And these have been very widely documented for the Roman provinces, for the Western provinces as well. But the social implications of these shifts from forms of um, production have been less well studied, although there is comparative evidence from other periods. Different economic systems could produce different household structures as they required different forms of labor. The intensification might shift who is doing what. The intensification could lead to full-time specialization. And once you start getting full-time specialisation, you can potentially have such specialist roles allocated by gender, by age, by status. Now, understanding this relationship between gender and specialised work and specific tasks, economic tasks, is somewhat fraught because it's been blighted with essentialist views of labour and work. That anything that involves heavy lifting can only be carried out by men, basically. can only be carried out by adult men. And so there's been an assumption that certain tasks um, are sort of seen as being normatively male and certain tasks as normatively women um, because women are seen as lacking either physical strength or technical precision. And so this is lim there has been a limited thought about this. But one piece of work which was done in the 1980s was an ethnographic piece of work on pottery production by David Peacock. Um, and in this, although some of his assumptions are controversial, but in this he looks at differing scales of production. He puts together a model of the differing levels of pottery production. And at the basic level he has household production, which he argued would have been carried out primarily within a family context, and thereby by the women of the family. And he uses as his example Malvern ware. And uh, this, this is sort of some of the details of Northern Ware, which comes from Britain. It's concentrated on the border with Wales and the area around Malvern Hills. And they produce a very limited range of ceramic styles, and this kind of beaker thing is pretty typical of it. And it's not what you call fine pottery, and that's the fabric. And that is pretty cruddy um, fabric. 
Now, as you work from the distribution, this is the distribution of where these pots are found. This has a very, very limited distribution. And it looks as though there's not huge amounts of this being produced. Even when you do find it, it forms a very small percentage of the overall ceramic assemblage on any site, probably less than 10%. So this is probably very much a cottage industry, something that's carried out on a seasonal basis, probably involving the whole family, maybe the children in the family, working the clay to get it ready to form, um, something that can be done by the whole family. Um, and it has to be said that um, Peacock did go and study various different societies um, throughout um, partly in Europe and partly elsewhere, um, looking at the different modes of production, particular family production. Now, this contrasts with the famous sigillata industries of southern France, where we are talking extreme specialisation, um, not just in terms of pottery production, that there are people producing pottery, but that they are specialising in various stages of it, whether it's mould making, whether it's decoration, um, or whatever, whether it's finishing, whether it's the polishing, whether it's the firing. These become very specialised roles. It's almost like having a production line going on here. And when you look at the sort of circumstantial evidence of things like stamps and that kind of thing, um, it seems the names which are coming through suggest it's male-dominated. And Peacock argues that this is largely a male-dominated industry, as I said. It is, in some levels, um, supported by the stamps. Now, there are problems of essentialism with um, Peacock's model, assuming that the cottage industry is female and industrial industry is male. There are obvious issues with this, but it does raise the potential that, or the possibility, of a gendered dimension to the scale of production. The move from a production involving the whole family to one based upon practices of specialisation and the whole act of going to work um, would have encouraged new forms of family roles and new forms of hierarchies, possibly realigning family relations. Each gender allocated potentially to its own tasks. The one produced what is seen as the more menial tasks, or maybe the less economically active tasks, though there's been an awful lot of feminist critique about just how um, these notions of what is deemed a menial task and what's deemed a worthwhile task are in themselves gendered but that it potentially leads to a realignment of relationships within the family. Now, the idea of downplaying a woman's um, or specific economic contributions can also be seen if we turn to Gallia Belgica and um, the cloth production that we see within Gallia Belgica. And this is the very famous Eagle Tower, um, or Eagle Column, which is a funerary monument of the second Dinier family, who seem to have made their money from um, the uh, production and the selling of cloth. And they set up this um, monument to the family, to the deceased in the family. And one of the things which is distinctive about funerary monuments from this area, from Gallia Belgica, is that they show depictions of everyday life. You do get mythological scenes on them as well, and even in the Eagle Column, you, you have um, everyday life scenes juxtaposed with mythological scenes. But when you look at them, one of the things that you, that you notice is that there is this emphasis on the economic basis of the family's wealth, um, not just in this case of the Secundi, but more widely. And when we look at them, what we see are very definitely gendered roles within this, that panels um, that depict economic activity, the showing, the selling of cloth, um, even some of the more menial jobs, like the carting of cloth from one place to another, the people depicted are universally male. This here, there's also, as well as the sort of economic scenes such as this, which go through the stages of cloth production, there are also a series of everyday scenes, the serving of a banquet, um, and the wash, and I'm just thinking of it as being the washing up afterwards, but I'm not actually sure it's here, so I think it's meant to be bread making or something. Um, but within these everyday scenes, predominantly, the workforce, the slaves or the servants are depicted as men. The only women that you see within these are, by and large, um, sitting and enjoying the banquets with their husbands or with their men folk. The one scene within this column which would have depicted weaving, there is a scene on it which seems to depict weaving, and that is the one scene that is so badly decayed we can't make it out. 
So the only scene which might have had what we think of as typical women's work, um, and which obviously the Roman world presented as typical women's work, the weaving woman, um, we can't actually make out the gender or the sex of the person doing it. So the one thing which might have depicted an economically active female, unfortunately, is missing. <coughs> now this idea of economically active male um, and more passive female is repeated um, again and again. Um, when we look at the wider um, grouping um, of monuments from this region and iconography from this region. Um, what we see are the business activities from which the elite derive their wealth. And so it shows their labour and the labour of others. Scenes include cultivating the soil, collecting agricultural produce, fulling, brick making. Um, and then we get the elite, different scenes depicted of a man or a group of men clustered around a table or a counter which is covered in money, a bit like this one that's here. Um, but in these, as far as we can make out, the people showing working are men. Whether it's they're um, working with the products of other people's labour, like here, or they're actually carrying out the labour, as in here. Women are confined to a number, to a very restricted body of depictions. Um, by and large, they are shown with their families, as in here, in the kind of um, funerary portrait of the deceased. Usually with children, though in this case not, they are shown in the infamous hairdressing scene, um, which gets trotted out. If you actually search for this, uh, for Roman women on funerary release, it's amazing how often this particular scene comes up. Um, it's not just um, the Roman world, which has a bit of a blinkered view as to what you show in terms of women on release. The other thing they get shown as is depicted in the banquet, um, as we saw in the previous one, with um, accompanying the men of their family. What we rarely see is women actually engaged in economic activity. The one exception, well there are a couple of exceptions, one exception is um, this group here, because obviously the hairdressing scene, we tend to focus on the woman who's having her hair dressed, but of course there's a group of four female slaves surrounding her who are doing the actual work of dressing their hair and holding up the mirror and whatever else they're doing. This seems to be one way in which it is acceptable to show female slaves. But is this because actually they're not involved in the economic productivity of the household, or they're involved in an activity which is seen as being acceptable for them to do? Perhaps the lack of contribution to economic productivity makes this um, appropriate, makes this acceptable. The other exception, a very small number of reliefs, which have been studied by Tally Campen, um, which show here where you get the saleswoman. And this is one example of this, selling bread. And that, that, that she dis, um, discusses these in an absolutely fantastic paper in which she looks through the dress and argues that one of the reasons you get these is because these are not the elite women. These are women who have enough wealth to be able to afford to be depicted on a relief, but they're not the elite, as in the case of probably um, the wife of the Secundi, Secundini family, or equivalent. So depiction as active in this sense, as being responsible for your own business, um, is quite limited, and is limited to a restricted social class. Now, it is worth bearing in mind what these are showing, because these are not showing real life. Um, we know there are women involved in industries. There's the evidence of the brick industries from Italy which show women running and controlling these firms. Um, we have plenty of epigraphic evidence which has been collected by um, Sandra Joshua from Rome, which is showing that there are lots of women who are economically active. What is interesting about these is that this is about how an ideology has been created. This is showing the idealization of labor idealization of work and it is an idealization that whatever the reality and the reality is very unlikely to be what's depicted whatever the reality women are economically inactive men are economically active in these cases we are we literally have the work of women being made invisible so we've done urbanism we've done economic activity the third one i said i'll talk about is the military 
Um, and I'm going to spend probably less time on this than any other. Um, the third way of incorporating um, peoples of the provinces into the Roman Empire and Roman imperialism was through military service. From the time of Augustus, Rome's soldiers, both legionary and auxiliary, were increasingly drawn from provincial populations and garrisoned out in the provinces, and a huge number of these in the western provinces. Whilst women had no role as enlisted soldiers, as far as we know, um, military communities were not um, the men-only um, preserves that um, Roman historians and archaeologists of the early 20th century wished they had been. There is plenty of evidence from epigraphy um, and from the kinds of materials we're finding on such sites to demonstrate that women and their families are accompanying um, soldiers. And in fact, my favourite one is a soldier who is accompanied by his mother-in-law and sets up an epitaph to her when she dies. So the soldiers, there are probably an awful lot of women and children um, within the areas of force, not just those that are um, married or um, the families of the commanders, who we know take their um, wives with them, particularly the officers, and you just need to think about some of the um, stories in Tacitus about um, women and, um, having to be protected through the, during the various Pannonian and German revolts. Um, but even below that level, the level of the standard soldier, they are forming relationships, not acknowledged, they don't have a legal status until they become veterans, but they are there. So we're not seeing a male-only environment. But what was life like for these women, the women on these frontiers, the women um, attached to these garrisons? They would potentially have been thrown into a completely different society. The work which is being done on soldiers at the moment by the likes of Ian Haynes, Adrian Goldsworthy, Simon James, is looking at this idea of a kind of military identity and how the routines of military life are producing almost like a band of brothers. And so creating this idea of a soldier who is a member of soldiers, who has an affiliation with the soldiers in his unit or whatever, through the routines um, of being a soldier. But this was not open to women. For a woman, she does not have the support of um, this band of brothers. She doesn't have um, the, uh, uh, this kind of lifestyle. So she would have had to form a new way of living, new friendships, new alliances, inside and outside the Fort Gates. One of our best insights into this is the um, Vindolanda tablets. And this is probably the most famous and unfortunately has tended to blur the picture because this is the famous, the infamous birthday invite um, where Claudia Severa, um, who is the wife of one commander, sends to Lepidina, who is the wife of the co uh, commander of um, Vindolanda, and says, come to my birthday. I give you a warm invitation to make the day more enjoyable for me by your arrival. And the problem is that this invitation to a birthday party has been seen as typically trivialising the role of women on the forts um, and within the military sphere. They just sort of survive there and they go for nice birthday parties with each other and that's the life of a woman on the frontier. When you dig a little more deeply into some of the others, actually, um, what you start to see a picture of emerging, and Beth Green has teased out some of, <laughs> some of the details of this, is potentially a rival network. A rival system of network and patronage is the kind of thing that we take for granted amongst um, male politicians and male um, commanders, um, which we can see very clearly through the Vindolanda tablets in terms of the husbands of these women. But actually, what we see going on is potentially these kinds of network liaisons going on between the wives of the commanders within um, these um, communities. That being invited to a birthday party, okay, but that this kind of idea of reciprocal entertaining and that um, we see greetings where they will greet the person they're writing to, but also their spouse, whether it's a male or a female, and that their spouse, whether husband or wife, also sends greetings. And so this is becoming more of a network, a network where um, you can send the greetings of your wife, etc to your fellow commander of a different force, very historiologist. Um, more intriguing is the letter from Valletta, 
to Serialis, who is um, a commander, and sending her greetings, I asked my lord that you relax your severity, and through Lepidina that you might grant me what I ask for. This is all this fragment says, so we don't know what's being asked for, we don't know what's going on, but do we have a situation where Valletta, who we know nothing else about, but maybe one of the um, non-legally recognised wives of one of the soldiers, or somebody attached to the, to the civilian settlement, attached to the fort, is this one occasion where she's saying, okay, I need something doing, I will ask the wife's, the command, the wife's, the wife of the commander, sorry, let me get my um, genitives in the right place. She will ask the wife of the commander to intercede on her behalf. Are the wives of these commanders actually taking on a wider, very unofficial, but a wider role in these activities? We have tantalizing fragments, we have tantalizing hints, but certainly what these are pointing to is that it's not the frivolous life of the round of birthday parties, um, which has sometimes been depicted. The flip side of this is what happens when you take a large number of soldiers out of a single community and send them to serve, or at least a large number of young men out of a single community, turn them into Roman soldiers and send them to serve in a distant province. What happens when you potentially skew the demographics of the home communities? And this is something which has sort of been looked at, but again, not from a perspective of how does this potentially skew gender relations within these communities. So there are two very large areas which have been studied um, in the Western provinces, which are supplying huge numbers of troops. One of these are the Batavians, the tribe of the Batavians, who are formed um, as an artificial grouping on the mouth of the Rhine. Um, right up, yes, here, the mouth of the Rhine in the modern day Netherlands, who have been the subject of about at least 30 years, 40 years extensive study by the University of Amsterdam. Um, the size of recruitment is estimated to be over 5,000 men at any one time from that tribe will be serving as part of the army. That has been estimated as one young man or one man from every single family. The majority seem to have returned home on discharge, certainly during the first and second centuries AD. So they seem to have served their 20 years as an auxiliary soldier, maybe a little bit longer as a veteran, and then gone back home. So whilst they're away, Potentially, this would have given women a more dominant role within the family or within the communities. And certainly this is something that Carol Van Drew Murray has argued and has looked at. And she argues that actually what we see is agricultural-based production, um, looking at ethnographic parallels for where you have huge amounts of young men taken out of a society. But then they come back bringing with them what seems to be a martial ideology bringing back some souvenirs of their, of their um, weapons and their armour, which they seem to be displaying within their houses. So potentially creating different ideas of masculinity within this society. But what happens when they don't go back, and this seems to be the case in northwestern Tarragonensis, where rather than the numbers um, study, uh, serving at one time, there's been the estimate of the total number which is 15,000 auxiliary troops serving in the Roman auxiliaries. But this is an area of Roman citizenship, so they're also providing legionary troops, and they seem to be providing um, Praetorian cohorts at the same time. They're serving, the majority of them are serving on the Rhine and the Danube frontiers. So they're serving on the very northern frontiers of the um, Roman Empire, and they seem not to be returning home. We don't seem to have the evidence of the majority returning home. So actually what you have in this case is a long-term demographic disruption. And you basically have absent men and potentially too many women. So if a large proportion of the young men left the area and are not returning in their 40s, does this leave a sizable number of unmarried women? And in which case, what is the role and the status within their families and wider society? There's been a lot of work done on how the sort of missing generation from the end of World War I 
caused a disruption in ideas of, um, in women's lives um, in the 20, 1920s and 30s in Britain. Obviously, we're not going to be seeing exact parallels, but there is the potential for a similar disruption to be going on. Does this increase the prominence of, and authority of women overall, which may be the case, or actually does it create a sub-hierarchy of women between those who have managed to find themselves a man and get married and those who are unmarried, um, giving the remaining men, the men who do come back or the men who don't go and serve as soldiers, greater social worth. So in all of these three fields, urbanism, economy, military service, we can take these existing studies, all of this is existing work, existing material that's in the domain, existing um, analysis which has been made. But the social fact side of this and the gender side of this has been ignored in all of these case studies. But so if we take these existing studies of impacts of imperialism and add the question of gender, although somewhat tentative, we can start to understand how wider changes impacted not only on the lives of women, but on the modes of gender differentiation. Whilst we don't know enough about the pre-existing gender structures, um, imperialism had the potential to bring a shift in relations between men and women through the demands made by the Roman state on these communities and the changes which come because of these demands. Imperialism has the potential to bring a shift in relations between men and women. Um, all of these case studies are generally discussed in gender-neutral terms. But by explicitly considering the potential for the demands, um, for these demands to disrupt the lives of women, we can interrogate existing studies to answer different questions. The add women and stir approach should not be the end of our inquiries into Roman imperialism, but it can provide the first step to opening up new avenues for research. Now, so far, I've thought about, okay, we have this potential, and studying case studies where we know there is impact um, through Roman imperialism. And so I've examined how established research can be reframed to consider the impact of um, imperialism on women. But one thing I've omitted is the question of gender in the family, which for most people would actually be the starting point. Research in Roman fa into Roman families since the 1980s has been um, very vibrant and very um, has sort of recast a lot of what's going on, focusing on questions of extended versus nuclear family, patterns of inheritance, and roles of women within the family. But with a few notable exceptions, most of these um, have been focused on Rome and Italy, and there's been far less examination of family roles within the provinces. And one reason for this has been a level of doubt about the forms of evidence. Um, that we don't have literary sources describing this for the Western provinces. Um, our iconography is subject to is, is the product of a very small part of society. It is subject to the ideological distortion. There's been a tendency to enter into inscriptions, and in particular epitaphs, um, to try and examine some of these issues following on the work from Salah and Shaw. However, again, there have been numerous objections to how far these map family organisation and how far they are biased towards an unrepresentative sample. And so there's been, um, Huebner, been Huebner has compared the analysis of epitaphs um, with census returns in Egypt, and concluded that while patterns of commemoration on tombstones suggest a nuclear family structure, census returns show an extended family structure, so which is the reality. Again, there is the objection to the epigraphy, to the epitaphs, that we are seeing distortion and not the real picture. And this has led to a certain pessimism about the ability to reconstruct family relationships, but perhaps we need to be more precise about what we're trying to understand with this form of evidence. Families are an important arena within which gender roles are learned from only as childhood onwards. And this might in part be a product of how the family is formed and who is able to inherit, but it also rests on which family members are endowed with authority and respect, and how these figures are determined by gender and age. And one element of this is who is deemed worthy of being commemorated. So who is being deemed um, honor, uh, sort of <laughs> has enough authority or is respected enough to be commemorated, but also who is deemed to have to be the appropriate person to carry out the act of commemoration. Now every family likes to think that it has its own peculiar relationships 
And the public, the public character of commemoration is um, tempered with sentiment. But we need to sort of set this against a desire to conform. And so consequently, we can use the analysis of large numbers of inscriptions and recorded ages at death to begin to understand the roles within families, but who is being regarded as being worthy of respect or who is seen as having authority or being an appropriate person to do certain things. And it's once we start doing this that the homogenous idea of the Roman family begins to fragment. And here I'm going to focus on the evidence from the Iberian Peninsula, not only because it's an area that I work on, not only because it's an area where there are vast numbers of inscriptions being published at the moment, but also because when you start doing this kind of study, you start getting strange patterns. And this goes right the way back to Salomon Shaw's 1984 um, study, publications and studies, where whenever they had really nice, neat patterns for the Western provinces, you then look at the Iberian data and go, ah, we're, being, we're doing strange things there. And so this, this actually is a long-established precedence that Iberia doesn't do what the rest of the Western provinces are. I'm going to focus in part on the so-called Gomentus Estigitanus, partly for a pragmatic reason that the updated CIL has just been published for that, um, but also um, it has a large body of inscriptions. It isn't dominated by a provincial capital. And so arguably it's giving us a bit of a sort of more representative picture, which is my first one. Yes, Gomentus Estigitanus. And the first thing I did was actually to record all the individuals commemorated in epitaphs. Um, not just those who have their ages at death recorded, but anybody who has an epitaph set up to them. And immediately we get a discrepancy from the expected profile. The standard thing which is trotted out, and which does seem to be the case everywhere else, is that women are less likely to be commemorated in epitaphs. When you look at the, when you actually do this um, for Conventus Estigitanus, this is not the case. Um, it's roughly, very roughly, 50-50. Um, you will notice my, um, my numbers, my percentages do not, add up, do not add up to 100%. The remaining ones are ones where it is, there isn't any real way of determining whether it's a male or female. The name is corrupt and there is no further indication, such as adjectives, um, which give you a, a, an idea of who the, dece the gender of the deceased. Um, comparative data is problematic. Um, because everyone focuses in, because going through all these bodies of inscriptions, pulling out the data is lengthy enough, most people just go for the ones with age statements that you can do other things with. And I have to say, I've been as guilty of that myself in previous studies. Um, this is the only one where I've actually recorded everybody. So, although we can talk about um, sort of an equality, not equality, but an even distribution in terms of who is commemorated, what we can do slightly more is who is doing commemoration. And if we look at um, both the work that, both the data that I have from the Sigitanus, we see that women are more involved in the commemoration of their children. Um, when we look at Iberia more broadly, and this is taking the Salah and Shore example, so this is the ones which have an age statement attached, we see this is exactly the same thing. That in Iberia as a whole, we have 257 examples of parents commemorating children, um, of which 59.1% are by their mother, 19.1% by both parents, and 21.8% by their father alone. And this was actually mirrored um, in the Sigitana stuff, where I think, if I remember right, it was 50% by the mother alone, 25% by both parents, and 25% by men alone. So women, mothers, are seen as it being appropriate for them to be heavily involved in the commemoration of the deceased. You can then come up with nice and neat explanations. Well, of course, you would role of the mother, the caring for the dead child, this, that, and the other. And so you look at Salary and Shaw's figures for Italy, which show 63.2% by fathers alone and 20.6% by mothers alone, and not a huge number by the parents together. There is a marked contrast between um, Iberia and the rest of the Western provinces in terms of the visibility of women as commemorators, of mothers as commemorators. Um, the stark difference between the two regions cannot be attributed to mortality patterns, but should instead be seen as differences in how family roles were valued and the emphasis placed on the mother as the appropriate person to act as commemorator for the deceased child. 
Now this prominence of women on epitaphs, both as being commemorated and as being commemorator, um, is one aspect where we see Iberia differing from other provinces. But the second is the shape of the relationship um, within the, the family. Um, the first indication of this, again, goes back to the work of Solomon Shaw, in which they calculated average age at which the spouse took over from the parents as commemorated from the deceased. Their aim with this was to try and understand, or to try and guesstimate, age of first marriage. And they established um, approximately a 10 year um, difference. And they established that for most areas in the Latin West, um, this shift from birth family to marriage family occurred in the late teens, early 20s for women, and the late 20s and early 30s for men. A nice 10 year gap. However, included in the samples were Baitica and Lusitania, where we see that parents stay the dominant commemorator until early 30s for women and over 40 for men. So this is the age of the deceased. So you're commemorated um, by your parents until long after we expect you um, to be married in the ancient world, or at least long after everything that we know about the ancient world tells us about being married. So on top of this, um, research that I've done, um, and which I started work on in the, um, first published in um, 2000s, and have carried on working on ever since, uh, whenever I sort of get a new body of that inscriptions, um, has been to take a slightly different approach, and that is the life course approach. And that is to deem that the majority of inscriptions of epitaphs, sorry, do not contain the ages of the deceased. There are one or two exceptions where it is frequent, but by and large, it's been estimated that probably between a quarter and a third of epitaphs mention the age of death of the deceased, and so contain an age statement. So my argument is that the age statement is only there when it's important. And if you plot the age statements, for um, central Italy um, and for southern France, for example, you notice that by far the vast majority of age statements refer to both men and women who have died under the ages of 30. Now, this does not match demographic profiles. This is not a demographic trend. This is about the age when the death is more poignant. And you can think of the idea of mors immatura. And you can think of all those tombstones and all those epitaphs where they talk about, address the passerby and say, look, I have died before my time. There is about a five to ten, five year difference in the peaks between male and female, which respond quite neatly to this marriage difference. By the age, so if you're talking about somewhere like Central Italy and Narbonensis, over 80% of age statements are recording people who have died at 30 or younger. And so this is, an, this is a statement of sentiment. This is a statement that tells us something about um, <coughs> how they're viewed. The view that they are, um, to a large extent, their death is taking on additional poignancy because they are so young. If you die in your 50s, you've lived your life, that's it, it doesn't need to be, it's not particularly, um, the age does not add additional poignancy. When we then add in, Three data sets from Spain: uh, Conventus Digitanus, which I've already which I've already talked about; Con uh, the Conventus Cordobensis, which is the area surrounding Cordoba, also in Baetica. And then I have to say, I have used um, Jonathan Edmondson's work on Salamanca and taken his data and his working and done a similar kind of thing with it. When you look at the Spain one, it is immediately obvious that we are seeing a very different profile. That, and this is percentage of the entirety of the age statements from that region. So if you have an age statement put against your, on your epitaph if you're from Spain or from Iberia, should I say, you have that idea of more immature. But then you have a secondary thing that pops up, 51 to 70 for both sexes. Grandparents, possibly, um, could be the case. So what we're potentially seeing is that there is an, a respect for older age groups and that their higher ages are being recorded. 
And in fact, it's also notable in Spain that you get far later, you get huge, you get comparatively larger numbers of people recorded in their 80s, their 90s, and even over 100. Now, in explaining these two profiles, these different profiles, it is important to remember that neither represents a demographic profile, but these are ideologies of age. More's a maturer, but one where the older generation in Iberia carry on having a significant role in the family. They carry on commemorating their children even after they've been married. They carry on being commemorated and having their ages recorded. So taken together, the increased visibility of women as commemorators and as commemorated, and the different family relations seen in the Iberian provinces, this raises the impact of Roman imperialism on family structures. It raises the impact because this is one of the most heavily, certainly Baetica, southern Spain, by most of our criteria, this is one of the most heavily Romanized areas in the western provinces. We have huge numbers of towns, we have huge numbers of recorded magistrates, we have lots of things, villas, um, architecture, whichever thing you choose to look at. These are all inscriptions in Latin in an area that didn't have a huge epigraphic habit prior to that and was in a different language. So they are taking on, in the majority of the aspects of their lives, a form of culture which can be seen as Roman. But in contrast to the political, the economic elements, they are retaining their family structures. And this is not unique, we can do more studies to demonstrate this, but in, um, certainly there are papers on Phrygia, papers on Egypt, which show what seems to be the continu continuation of pre-existing family structures. Here we have them expressed through very Roman means of commemoration in the Latin language, but that the relationships that are being expressed are not what we expect from Italy. We have greater prominence of women and greater prominence of the older members of the families. So what this does, I, I sort of made my subtitle new, new Light on an Old Question. The old question, of course, being cultural change and potentially Romanization. But what does it mean for our models of organisation if we are taking some work that by any other criteria we would say has been heavily influenced, heavily impacted on by Roman imperialism? And we see this strange picture, this continuity in terms of family structures. What does this actually tell us about Roman imperialism and Roman cultural change? Instead of an all-encompassing picture of imperialism, what we're seeing is a nuance to it, a nuance in counter-imperialism and cultural change. Rather than all-encompassing monolithic institutions, Roman imperialism becomes a phenomenon with its own limits. Um, it is not a simple product of resistance or rejection. But there are certain aspects of life which are just not impacted on by Rome. And one of these may well, in certain areas, be family structures and be gender. And so, in turn, not only can we ask new questions about imperialism or new, family, new questions about gender using our existing models of imperialism, but we can turn it around. And we can use this um, work on gender and the family to actually explore what the limits might be of this previously viewed as all-encompassing phenomenon of imperialism. Right, um, I'm afraid I've run over slightly, so I apologise for that, but thank you very much.